There's something happening all across our country. People of all ages and colors and creeds who are, yes, taken to the streets and also rallying our friends, organizing our neighbors, and getting out the vote. And I'm so inspired by a new generation pushing us to live the values we share, decency and fairness, justice and love. So let's fight with conviction. Let's fight with hope. Let's fight with confidence in ourselves and a commitment to each other, to the America we know is possible, the America we love. upon the rocks of hard truth. And after three and a half years of this administration perfecting subterfuge, mendacity, and delusion, the time has come to keep it real. You know, we have a pandemic that has been rapid in this country for months, over 200,000 lives unnecessarily lost because of no plan. And even after a COVID-19 diagnosis, the president still has not demonstrated any honor, dignity, or com nor compassion. And I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about the outbreak of the coronavirus within the inner circle of the Trump administration. Now is not the time nor the forum for that conversation to be had. But you know, what I wanna talk about is the future, right? And so in a speech that I gave last week before the Supreme Court, I quoted French writer Victor Hugo, who reminds us that nothing is more strong than an idea whose time has come. And if that's true, the corollary must also be true, that nothing is more weaker and more desperate than an idea whose time has passed and still scrapes and claws to maintain relevance, right? So my friend and fellow, Bo fellow Buddhist teacher, Ethan Nickturn shared some wisdom that I think is equally appropriate, not only for the context of the conversation that we're gonna have today, but in the context of where we are electorally. So start acting like you're a member of a compassionate majority up against a desperate, fearful, shrinking minority, because you are. Let me holler at you again with that. Everyone, start acting like you are a member of a compassionate majority up against a desperate, fearful, shrinking minority, because you are. You know, this is not a moment to, to bemoan the past. This is a moment to reimagine our future. And here's how we're gonna go about doing it. You know, first of all, tonight, the vice presidential debate between Senator Kamala Harris and Vice President Pence is happening. So for the first time in history, there will be a woman of color, a graduate of a historically black college, among other accolades and accomplishments, will be taking the stage as a candidate for vice president of the United States. Like that's, that's great, right? And as I stated in my yoga class I taught this morning, that simple fact is poignant and we shouldn't gloss over that fact and I will not gloss over that. And while Mr. Pence will not be as bellicose, belligerent or bullying as Donald Trump, he lies with a more placid demeanor. So like his flow is a little bit more placid but his subterfuge is, is the same. And he will insist that we need to stay the course and do so in soothing monotones and smiles straight from the conservative central casting. And we just can't fall for this okie doke anymore, y'all. You know, I want us to stay focused and to quote Childish Gambino, stay woke. This is America. You know what I'm saying? So starting on this Sunday, Move On will be launching a Your Vote is Power live stream series. This series builds upon the resistant win calls that we've done over the past um, several years during the resistance which bring hundreds of thousands of people together to take action and be inspired as we head into the final month of election season. They begin this Sunday and will feature movement leaders, progressive champions, and move on staff and, and, and members. So starting this Sunday at 8 p.m., um, Your Vote is Power live stream series. So check it out on our website. And we're still organizing and calling senators to stop the nomination of Amy Coney Barrett. Again, stay woke. This is America. Like, don't get it twisted. Like, just because the president got sick doesn't mean that Mitch McConnell got less evil. You know what I mean? So, like, he, we're calling and organizing petitions to, like, keep the Senate from meeting because three, count them, three Republican senators have the coronavirus. Like, so we need to be 
making sure that they don't proceed with this uh, mockery of a, of, a, of a trial, not a trial, but of a confirmation, because the Senate Republican caucus remains caught in this dystopian delusional world that's separated from our reality. But it's our job writ large to keep reminding them that the people won't stand for this power grab. We the people see through your hustle. And if you, if you continue to do so, we'll hold you accountable, right? And I want us to settle into the following statement because I believe this to the, tr the core of my being. It is a blessing to live in times of great challenge where everything is up for discussion. That means we get to rewrite the rules. We get to reimagine policy. We get to step bold into the future that is required as opposed to the past that was insufficient, right? This is the season that we've all been hoping for leading up to a moment we've all been waiting for, a chance to reimagine our government as one that serves the needs of others, not only in the acute crises of the moment, but one that focuses on our collective well-being day by day by day in service of the people. Move on is organizing petitions and encouraging you know, everyone to fight the Supreme Court nomination process. Um, and we're also several, we have also several campaigns in effect. So one is your vote is power and mobilize to win. So everyone can plug in to reach high potential voters and mobilize their networks via vote tripling. So in conclusion for the intro, I've said this for the past several intros, but again, it's highly unlikely that all the votes will be counted on November 3rd. That is called mathematics. <laughs> it's called arithmetic. It's called democracy. So we cannot fall into the, oh my goodness, like whatever yarn he's gonna spin, we can't fall for that, right? So we must prepare for that psychologically and not fall victim to quote unquote disappointment. So we gotta stay, we gotta stay vigilant on this. And secondly, we cannot get so focused, focused on removing Donald Trump that we ignore the fact that we gotta take back the Senate and not only take back the Senate, we've got to improve the House majority, and in so doing, improve the House majority with great progressive candidates like the one we're about to talk to. Um, so we need the, the Biden-Harris White House, Senate majority Democrat, House majority Democrat, trendy more progressive. That's where we're headed, and that's what we need to focus on. So voting, it's voting season. So whether you're voting by mail or voting in person or voting early, get to it. And, Registration dates, um, deadline for registration, those dates are coming up soon. So be mindful of that as well. Pay attention. So those of you who are waiting till the last minute, what are you waiting for? Let's be real about this, right? Stop playing. So text we got us to 668-366 in order to get involved in our voter mobilization efforts. And a reminder, put your comments in the chat. I'll be monitoring the chat. We'd love to hear from you in real time, especially given the brother we got on today. So enough of me, real talk, let's get to the main event. And before I introduce our guest, I'd like to acknowledge the beauty of the moment that's about to transpire. Two unapologetic, powerful black men to talk strategy, hip hop and inspiration at a time when as recent as this weekend, another black man was shot to death by the police. So our success, our conversation will be in defiance to the American norm that seeks to silence and destroy us, so know that. And in a system that seeks to destroy and minimalize or otherwise ridicule black intelligence, both myself and my guests are this joyful defiance focused on meeting the needs of the moment. Quoting the sage Maya Angelou, you may write me down, you may write, down, write, my, write me down in history with your bitter twisted lies. You may trod me like the very dirt, but still like dust, I'll rise. We will rise, we will meet the needs of this moment. So here we go, we're not going anywhere. So to that point, Let's get to it. Jamal Bowman is the Democratic nominee and likely next member of Congress in New York's 16th district, representing parts of Westchester, Westchester County and the Bronx. Dr. Bowman has been an educator and advocate in public schools for 20 years. As I find my notes, <laughs> pardon me. And representation matters. Like So Dr. Bowman has been represented for 20 years in public school, and he had a stunning primary victory that many people wrote him off, but he knew in his heart of hearts what he needed to do, right? So I lost my place. Give me a second. Here we go. Without further ado, let's introduce Jamal Bowman to the show. Welcome. You can tell it's live, live and direct. Here we are, Jamal, welcome to the show. Pardon my my humanity, happy to have you. Great to be here, brother. Thank you so much for having me, it's a pleasure. Right, so let's just get started like we talked about. So we talked about, you and I were going back and forth before we got on air. Um, hip hop is my religion, hip hop is my Bible. 
So as you were coming up, what is your Bible? What is your hip hop hits? What are the texts that got you through childhood and also inform not only your education, but inform you as a candidate and will form you as an elected official? It informed my consciousness uh, from a very young age. Uh, so my hip hop Bible will, will include uh, Payton, the Payton Phil album uh, by Eric B and Rakim, uh, the By Any Means Necessary album uh, by Karis One and Boogie Down Productions, the Public Enemy album, uh, It Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back, and the X-Clan album, uh, To the East Blackwood. And there are so many others uh, that I could mention, but I'll, ju I'll just start with those four um, as, as, as the four that, again, gave me a level of consciousness, a level of self-love and self-esteem and self-worth as a Black man in America that I was not receiving in public schools and that I never received in public schools. And unfortunately, our students, whether in public or private schools, are still not receiving that level of education and that level of consciousness, which is hopefully going to be part of my work when I get to Congress and become part of the Education and Labor Committee. And, you know, you, we also have New Haven in common. So you went to University of New Haven. I'm Yale class of 97. So shout out to New Haven. Shout out to New Haven. So how are you and how and, and what's going on in your life these days? So like, so you still have a campaign, you won the primary, you still have a campaign. So what, what's occupying your time these days? What's, what's going on? Yeah, so we're in the general election. Uh, we do not have a Republican opponent, so that's good. Uh, there is someone from the conservative party in the race, uh, but this is a deep democratic district. So we, we like our chances there. Uh, since the primary, we've been organizing around the census, uh, trying to get our census numbers up, uh, specifically in Yonkers, Mount Vernon, parts of New Rochelle, and the Northeast Bronx. As you know, census numbers are historically low uh, in communities of color and, poor, and poorer communities. So those are the communities that we are targeting, uh, and we're continuing to organize around that work. And the census is key. So you see Trump, he tried to take away uh, a few dates in terms of our ability to complete the census. Those dates are back and we now have until Halloween uh, to complete the census. And for every individual that completes the census, that's about $2,500 of resources into your community. So we're talking infrastructure, housing, healthcare, education, uh, jobs, right? So this is, this is one of the reasons why many of our communities are historically uh, under-resourced because we don't historically fill out the census in high numbers. So please be counted and make sure to get the census complete. So we've been doing organizing around the census, but also just hosting meet and greets and going to meet and greets throughout the district. I'm uh, really trying to get to know everyone in the district, really trying to get to know what those needs are, uh, listening so I can continue to align policy uh, to the needs of the district, but also connecting with, with those who didn't support me during the primary, who were right. supporters of Congressman Engel. You know, I understand that and I appreciate that, uh, but I'm still going to do my best to serve them as well. So it's about meeting them where they are, again, listening and learning uh, and starting to work once we win our general election on November 3rd. I appreciate that. And I, I actually, now I want to give you, I want to give you due since I lost my place. I want to give due to what you've done, right? So you were most recently the principal for Cornerstone Academy for Social Action, CASA, a public middle school you founded in 2009 in, Bay, in the Baychester neighborhood of the Bronx. And, you know, you were endorsed by the New York Times, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, Homie AOC, AP, Ayanna Presley, Katie Porter, all my friends, New York State nurses, move on, justice Democrats. So you are the left of the left, it, 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 it could be said, which is fine because, you know, hi, how are you? I, 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 um, so we're hearing, so tell us before I get into like the specific policy proposals that you have, which I'm super inspired by, tell us about New York 16, right? So what is it about New York 16? What inspired you to run? And um, what's happening in New York 16 right now? So New York 16 is a tale of two districts. Uh, if we were a nation, we would have the eighth worst economic inequality in the world. Uh, we have both the highest number of WIC recipients in, of any congressional district in the country, and we have Scarsdale and Riverdale and Bronxville, which, you know, Scarsdale is the second most affluent community in the nation. Uh, and it, so we're segregated, not just economically, but unfortunately, obviously, uh, by race as well. So for the last 10 years, I've served uh, the other side of the district, the under-resourced side of the district, 
for 10 years as a middle school principal. Uh, we're located right off of Boston Road and Dyer Avenue, right around the corner from Boston Secor Housing Project, uh, half a mile walk from Eden Wall Projects across the highway from Co-op City. So I've served in that capacity kids who are the most in need, kids who have been the most ignored, most oppressed, most neglected, uh, most disenfranchised. Uh, and it's through that experience uh, of serving uh, my students and contrasting it to uh, when I take my daughter to the park in New Rochelle, or when we go to Trader Joe's in uh, Mamaroneck, or when we drive through Scarsdale, and just looking at the disparities. I mean, it, it's, 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 it's unheard of, and it's not new. Uh, to quote Tupac, you know, one thing Black people have in common is poverty. And when you drive through areas like Mount Vernon and Yonkers and Northeast Bronx, and you see boarded up houses and boarded up buildings, and in other parts of the district, you see affluence and incredible wealth, I just got to the point where it was like enough is enough. And Word. and on a very personal level, you know, I have uh, students who suffer suffer from mental distress, who were self-mutilating in our schools and, and needed help and need to be referred for psychiatric evaluations. Uh, I have students who, who family members were murdered, you know, over the weekend and they still had to come to school and, and just figure it out and continue. Uh, I've had students who have been, you know, sexually assaulted uh, by family members. Uh, parents who have lost their homes and had to move to Queens and travel to the Bronx. So I've had students who've gone through all of this and I, I was just tired yeah, of cool. a political arena that, that doesn't center our children and doesn't center those who are most vulnerable in our society. So not just our children, our youngest children, uh, not just our children, but our children with special needs, uh, not just our family, but families who live in areas of concentrated poverty that have been created due to policies like redlining. So for me, it was like, you know what? I got to do something about this. I started my own school, uh, did good work there. Uh, I was an education organizer fighting for funding equity and culturally responsive schools and all of those things. And I still, you know, would have to deal with, you know, 2017, 2018, 34 children died within the K-12 school system in the Bronx, 17 died via suicide. One of those suicides was a ninth grade student who jumped off a building in Co-op City right after school to die by suicide. And a homicide occurred right here in New Rochelle High School when two girls got into an argument, one pulled out a knife, stabbed the other and killed her. And when you have homicide and suicide amongst children, you're, you're dealing with an inhumane society, a sick society. And that homicide and suicide is connected to trauma, connected to poverty that comes from bad policy by design it is not the fault of the people in these communities that have been neglected. It's our elected officials and political arena that needs to do more. So that's why I stepped into it. Yeah. And so first of all, like respect for the work that you did prior to and respect for like stepping into the arena, right? Because how many people do you know? We all know that it is like, oh, I guess that, you know, it is what it is. It'll be what it'll be. You took the step even further like to like run for office and not only run for office, you know, do things um, and, and propose bold policies, you know, that many people say are crazy or so, so, so or too much or extra or this, that or the other. So tell me a little bit about your reconstruction agenda. Tell me a little bit about the policies that you're proposing. Um, so you've, you've laid the groundwork where it came from. So tell me the policies that you would enact and seek to enact in office that like address the things that you just talked about. It's so crazy. If you're Black, if you're Latinx, if you're Indigenous, if you're poor, it's always too much, right? Whenever <laughs> whenever we ask for anything, uh, it's always too much. And you're right about that. Um, I, before I uh, answer your question, I just want to pay homage uh, to Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez, Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib, and Congresswoman Ayanna Presley. Because if it weren't for them, uh, and, and everything they were able to do and everything they represent, I would have not run for office in the first place. And this is, this is key because not only did they break through with their victories, but they just went in and started wrecking shop and tearing, <laughs> and tearing down white supremacy from the inside out. And we're talking about a white patriarchy that has been in place for 401 years. And you got these four women of color coming in and just tearing it apart and taking all the bullets uh, at the same time from Trump, the Republican Party, and many others. But yeah. they were speaking truth to power on the issues that mattered most to me. And they gave me a space and platform to talk about the things I care about. 
So I always want to start with paying them homage and paying them the respect, uh, because if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be here. Now, to your question of, around the reconstruction agenda, we cannot build a post-racial society without going through a reckoning as a nation and without going through a collective healing as a nation. When we talk about truth and reconciliation, similar to what happened in Germany, what happened in Rwanda, what happened in South Africa, we're talking about a process of healing as a nation. Our nation has an ugly, evil history. And we have to acknowledge that and pay homage to that and go through the process of, of apologizing, conversation, uh, hearings, congressional hearings that are transparent so the whole nation can be a part of and see a nation reckon, reckon with itself. And as we go through that process, we begin to heal. It has happened throughout American history, history in varied ways, right? When you talk about the abolitionist movement, the suffragist movement, the civil rights movement, you know, that was all a process of fighting for justice and going through a healing process. The Me Too movement, the Times Us Up movement as well. But truth and reconciliation as a nation is a process of pressing pause on our current structure and our current system, which you know many have called plantation capitalism. Healing as a nation, acknowledging the impact and the history of slavery and racism, not just in terms of individual people, but in terms of policy, from the Homestead Act to, you know, to the New Deal, to the GI Bill, to crack cocaine, to all of the policies and the behavior that continue to support the oppression of black and brown and indigenous people. We have to reckon with that. We have to apologize for that. We have to heal from that and then begin to implement new policy and resources into the communities that have been historically neglected through reparations. So that's access to housing, that's universal health care, that's free public education, that's checks in people's pockets and bank, bank accounts, uh, that's environmental justice. Again, heal the wounds and invest in, in allowing self-determination and self-actualization for communities that have been historically ignored. I'm going to reveal my inner nerd because anytime someone says self-actualization, it goes back to Maslow's hierarchy, right? Like, you know, like, how can I care about policy if I can't eat? You know what I mean? And like, how can I care about voting? Like if the system is like, has their foot on my neck, quite literally in, in the case of Brother Floyd, but like, you know, in terms of in more invisible ways, you know, it's one of the things and let's just shift to that. So I want, I wanted you to speak from your experience about how you deal with the fact. So when Brother Floyd passed away, Everyone was like, oh my goodness, it just hurt my feelings. It really hurt me to see like the knee on someone's neck for that long. When in more silent, more pernicious ways, policy has been on the neck of people who look like me and you since 17, whatever, right? 16, whatever. So with this, this Truth and Reconciliation Commission, how do you propose we begin that? Is that a congressional mandate? Does that happen locally? Where do you think that begins? It happens at a congressional level and it happens locally as well. So Congress the, the Congress has to lead this because Congress we we elect people to Congress to be our leaders and to set the course for our nation. And it has to be followed by what happens at the state, county, municipal and school board level. We want to get past this this legacy of racism that continues to live in our bones and move forward in a similar way that Germany has moved forward by acknowledging the, the, the history of the Holocaust in a very real and transparent way, as they should. We have to do the same thing here with African Americans who are the only people on this land that will literally chattel property of other human beings. If we don't reconcile that we're gonna to continue to have the cycle of institutional racism that lives within every institution. And this is key. It's not just about police brutality, which is a big part of it. It's not just about mass incarceration, which is a big part of it. It's about underfunded schools. It's about environmental justice and you being more likely to have asthma if you're brown in certain urban communities than anywhere else. It's about housing justice. It's about healthcare justice. It's institutional racism that lives everywhere. I mean, think about it. We, we're, it, as a developed nation, we incarcerate more folk than, than anywhere else. And we, we do it disproportionately focused on black and brown people. And as a developed nation, we have the highest rate of maternal morbidity and infant mortality that disproportionately impacts black women. 
If you are a black woman in a third world African country, you are less likely to die uh, of maternal morbidity than you are in America with all our resources. That shows you the impact of unconscious racism and implicit bias within every institution. So it starts at a congressional level, but it will continue at a state level, municipal level, and a school board level as well. But it's not just a conversation. It's acknowledgement of things like, um, things like, uh, you know, acknowledgement of the history, but acknowledgement also of, uh, you know, like um, Juneteenth, making Juneteenth a national holiday, right? Like that's, that's gonna be key to this. Um, it's also, I mentioned reparations as well. And I mentioned the areas that we need to invest. Yeah, and so there's a question in the chat. So y'all keep it coming in the chat. That's what we're here for, right? So uh, Sky Walk Up, um, I, I wouldn't mind a Sky Walk Up. I mean, that might be like when you get to the top, it would be all right, but the stairs might be a bit much. Uh, it says, so something that they worry about is if when and if Biden wins, a lot of people will lose focus on the issues that got attention during the Trump administration. So how will you keep issues you care about in the public eye if people go complacent? It's a great question. And, and what I'm excited about is it's not just me having that conversation. Word. It's myself, it's the squad, it's others in Congress, like Katie Porter and others. Uh, and it's, uh, it's platforms like this and many other platforms who continue to beat the drum of injustice and continue to fight for social justice. I have made a commitment in this district to be a movement congressperson, which means we will continue to organize and communities that have been historically ignored so that their voices could be a part of our democratic process. And in order to pass the policy we need in Washington, we need movements to put pressure on elected officials, right? Our complacency got us Donald Trump in the first place. Our complacency led to Republicans controlling the Senate and doing what they're doing now. We, we have learned our lesson. We are okay. not gonna be complacent any longer, but we have to engage and organize on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, democracy is a contact sport. And the same way you turn on ESPN to watch Sports Center, you have to engage in democracy in some way, shape, or form on a day-to-day -day basis. It's easier to do it with technology and social media, but then there are times where you need to get out in the street, you need to call your elected official, you need to have meeting, meetings about an injustice, and you have to connect with other organizations like you know, Working Families Party, Justice Democrats, the Jewish Vote, which is the C4 arm of Jews for Racial and Economic Justice, uh, Make the Road Action, Community Voices Heard, New York Communities for Change. There's so many organizations doing incredible work. You know, United We Dream. We need to get down with them and continue to help them grow their numbers so we can continue the movement aspect of the work that needs to be done. Yeah, another uh, comment in the chat that I think I think Jamal just answered that is like, do you believe it's possible for Congress to lead the fight against systemic institutional racism if um, it's foundational to the government? Isn't the onus on activists on the ground? It's 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 yes to both. I would say it's both Jamal. and it, yeah. it's yeah it's both and right. So sending someone like me to Congress, you sent me there to raise hell in Congress and to cause good trouble, but that's not enough because my colleagues are gonna have to be moved as well towards the policy that we need to pass. So that means organizing in South Carolina, in Texas, in Florida, in Colorado, across the country from the ground up to let people know, listen, if you don't get on board with the Green New Deal, if you don't get on board with Medicare for All, if you don't get on board with housing as a human right, we're gonna organize and vote you out of office and at the very least, put you in a primary that's incredibly competitive, right? And trust me, we colleagues, our colleagues don't want to go through that, especially if they've been chilling for 10, 20, 30 years. So it's both. It's me doing what I'm supposed to do and my colleagues doing what we're supposed to do in Congress, but also the movements continuing to hold us accountable if we don't. Yeah, and I'll offer a bit of context on that. So I have the unique job of being like the inside guy for the movement. <laughs> Right. So like I am in constantly in, in members of Congress face. So for like the squad who are my sisters, you know, like supporting them. So when the Democratic establishment didn't stand up for them in the beginning, because um, when Rashida said what she said about impeachment, it was just me and her for a day. Just like, yo, man, it's lonely out here. But, you know, we as a movement organized precinct by precinct by precinct. And by the end of the year, impeachment was a done deal. It didn't just fall out the sky. 
And if it were up to the leadership, it would not have necessarily happened. We made that happen, but it started with like the tremor um, um, that Rashida gave. Um, but then we as a movement held each elected official accountable. So in the beginning, it was like two people on the bill and then it became eight and then it became 16 and then it became 60. And, you know, I'm in the process, somebody having conversations with leadership is like, what number do you need to get to in order for you to make this happen, right? Uh, well, 140 would be good. Well, if I get you 140 and you don't act, act the right way, we're going to, you know, so like that is how this happens. It's not just like hate tweeting against somebody because they didn't go in your favor. You've got to be in it, on it, and persistent, right? So like it's both and. I like the way that you said that. Like it's yes, you need people to shake the tree, but you also need people to till the soil. That's right. That's right. And the more people we have, the better. So, you know, those who may be, you know, disenchanted and you feel a level of apathy and aren't engaged and sitting on the sideline and don't believe, every little bit helps. Every call, every text message, every letter, uh, just standing with someone at a press conference shows power and shows numbers. So every little bit helps and we need everyone to get involved. Especially fighting against the system, right? Like it takes every little bit to chip away in order for true progress to be attained. You know, and I, I've often been a part of meetings on Capitol Hill where we're discussing policy. I, so I have a business degree. So I view politics from a marketing perspective. I'm like, that's cute, but how's it going to sell? You know what I mean? I always ask people like, that's great, but how are people going to pay attention to this? So, but you and I both know that policy is often discussed from an extremely detached academic or, you know, horse trader kind of um, context, right? And you and I also both know that representation matter, words matter. That's why I appreciate how you show up and what you offer as a candidate. But tell me a little bit more about how social justice informs your policy perspectives and your prescriptions. So you talked about it from your academic perspective, but what else is happening in your district and through your lived experience that makes social justice like key for, for as, a, as a marker for you? Yeah, so it's everything. Uh, first and foremost, I mean, my kids have to travel on multiple buses to get fresh pro organic produce uh, if they can afford it, one, and then two, to even have access to it, right? So we're talking about communities that are food deserts and that are food insecure, where much of the grocery shopping is done at a bodega as opposed to a supermarket. Like this is something that many people take for granted, but it's something that my students deal with every day. Um, my wife is a second grade teacher. I have never seen her more stressed in our seven year marriage than she is now trying to figure out how to reopen school during a pandemic. And what makes it even more challenging is the Senate did not support the HEROES Act, so it hasn't moved. So we haven't received any resources since the CARES Act. And now parents are confused and frustrated and stressed about, should I send my kids to school or should I keep them home? How is remote learning gonna happen if I don't have laptops or Wi-Fi? And my wife was a teacher, didn't even have the time to really plan remote learning effectively. So you have many kids who aren't gonna receive the exemplary education that they deserve in one of the wealthiest nation on earth because our elected officials aren't moving the way they're moving. Um, so those are just two examples. You talk about food insecurity and, and, and what's happening with education. Public housing uh, right here in our district hasn't received a dime from the federal government in 10 years. Mm. And it's been disinvested over the last 30 years to the point where now we're, we're considering selling public housing to private individuals so that those private individuals can make a profit, right? When I go to public housing in my community, you could walk right in Door is broken. You can walk right in. Mailboxes are broken. Uh, elevators are broken. Uh, people are people have lead in their apartments. Uh, calling maintenance to fix the cabinet has taken months for people to respond. Massive disinvestment, massive neglect uh, in multiple areas that my kids and my family, on a personal level, dealing with on a, on a daily basis. Yeah, that's. Um it's time for an upgrade all the way around, right? So, you know, one of the, you know, with all due respect to some folks in Congress, like it's time for an upgrade um, of mindset 
um, of policy um, understanding and lived experience. Like the first guest that we had on the show was Sister Ilhan. And she talked about like how her lived experience informs her policy, right? You know, so she's like, as someone who's had to cobble together money to buy food in a food desert, I now understand why food, you know, so like she talked about that from her lived experience. And if that is the mindset that you have in informing policy, like that's only a net positive for all of us, right? So. Everyone needs to understand well, that. Well, right like, now, you know, Congress is 50% millionaires, right? right? And the other 50% are lawyers who work for millionaires. <laughs> and now we have, you know, elected officials like myself who, I lived in public housing. I lived in the projects on the Upper East Side. I lived in rent stabilized apartments. I was raised by a single mom who raised me and my three sisters on the, on the postal worker salary because of rent control and rent stabilization laws that allowed her to pay rent in alignment with her salary. So when we fight for housing as a human right, I'm not talking about somebody else, I'm talking about them and myself, because it was something that I, I lived through, but helped sustain me uh, in a community that allowed me to go to pretty decent schools and put myself in a position to run for Congress and win in the first place. So two more questions and then we're going to close out because I know you have a, a, a stop in a moment. You know, I, a, I attended a seminar yesterday where the brilliant Stacey Abrams and the beautiful thing about the incoming class of all of us is that we're all the same age, right? So, you know, a, AP's our age, like Rashida's our age, you know, so there's something about 40s and brown folks were just like, nah, yo, like, <laughs> nah, son, like enough, yo, enough. Y'all been tripping forever with six. So, you know, Stacey says something brilliant about, you know, when people have a the problem is not the quote unquote scarcity of resources, it's the poverty of imagination that compared with the rhetoric of scarcity of resources. So what are your reflections on the statement and how would you react if it, if it, it when it, it rears its head in the, in the next Congress? So it's so true. Uh, Sister Abrams is, is 100% correct. And throughout my professional life, I've been really frustrated by, by, by that thinking and the way our institutions function in alignment with that lack of imagination. And again, this lack of imagination is more pronounced if you are Black, Brown, Indigenous, or poor. It is not pronounced when you're the glorious white man looking to build a new nation uh, through manifest destiny, right? Like it, it's not pronounced there. It's not pronounced when you're like, you know what, we need an industrial revolution. Let's just, you know, let's just build Manhattan and build cities all over the country, right? Yeah. It's not pronounced when you're like, you know what, I want to put a man on the moon. We just going to put a man on the moon in the next 10 years and make that happen. Then we have all the imagination for the white man, but no imagination for black and brown folk. And that's the problem, right? So, so for me, you know, when I started a school, that was about imagination. That was about envisioning something that wasn't there. And it was a public school, not a charter school. And I make that distinction because many people were opening charter schools because that was the, the new thing, the new shiny thing that, that people were running to. I decided to open a public school that was a community school, district school with teachers unions, et cetera. And we were able to do great work there. Uh, our organizing is about political imagination. It's about, listen, this ain't working for folk. We got to do something different. And here's our vision for what that different is, because there are two sides of it. There's identifying what's wrong, but then providing a vision for what's right. And the thing about what's right, it has to be two, it has to have two sides of it. There's the moral argument, right? This is just this is just the right thing to do for people so they can survive. And then for the other side, so they can be happy. Let's make the economic argument. If we take care of folk, they contribute more to a thriving economy. How about that? As opposed to building an economy that doesn't work for, for 90% of people. So right. that, that imagination piece is key and it's critical because we have the resources, right? We, we, it's not about, we have the resources. We have both the financial and the human resources. If people are ready, willing, and able to work, and they're treated with dignity and respect and given opportunity, they will thrive and they will shock you. And that's the kind of economy and environment we need to create. Yeah, so the last two questions are, so, you know, we've seen, I've seen things in the past six months that I never thought I'd see. Like, I'm a huge basketball fan. I never thought I'd see Black Lives Matter on a court. 
Like, let's just keep it 2000 on that. And the NFL, which is e early as 2016, was like, you know, Colin is whatever now talking about voting, right? So these are things that I never thought I'd see. Um, but there's still people who say, brother, that, you know, my vote doesn't matter. This will never change. Like, what do you, even now, like, even though we've had record voting over the past several weeks in, in election season. So since we're in election season and there's still a little bit of that out there, what do you say to people that my vote doesn't matter? Why should I even care? So Donald Trump and the Senate being controlled by the Rep Republicans right now is why your vote matters. If Democrats control the Senate, and Hillary Clinton, as much as we didn't we didn't love her, was in the White House, we would have passed the HEROES Act, which would have brought a ton of resources to our community and help people who are starving right now. But because Republicans have control of the Senate and the White House, they're not moving on that bill whatsoever. If Democrats had control of the Senate and the White House, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act probably would have passed the Senate and we would have had it we would have had an end to no knock warrants which means no more Breonna Taylor's God willing and an end to qualified immunity which means we would be able to hold police accountable for the crimes that they commit against humanity so those are just two examples right there that are huge other examples include someone like me being sent to Congress, right? This is not, I never thought I would run for office. I never thought someone like me could even have a chance to run and win. But the people in this district turned out. We tripled voter turnout, triple turnout amongst young people and people of color, and we won by 16 points. Now my big mouth is gonna be joining Katie Porter and the squad in Congress, followed by Corey Bush and others, to make noise at the congressional level and continue to give pe people hope on the ground level. The last thing I'll say is this, Donald Trump won Michigan by 11,000 votes, 11,000. That's because Detroit and other areas didn't come out. If those areas come out, Donald Trump loses Michigan. If Philadelphia comes out for Pennsylvania, Donald Trump loses Pennsylvania. If black folk in Miami-Dade County come out for, for Biden, Trump loses Florida. Right. So this is so we're talking about winning or losing states and we're talking about electoral votes. Right. So this this is big. Four more years of Trump. I mean, look at what Trump has done. We got we got families being separated at the border. We have children in cages. We have hysterectomies and forced sterilization being being brought down and brought on immigrant our immigrant women, our immigrant sisters. That's what we're dealing with now. So we need everyone involved, all hands on deck. 94 million people did not vote in the last uh, election. 4.4 million Black folk who voted in 2012 did not vote in 2016. That number alone That's crazy. will lead us to victory. And then we could fight in terms of how far left we want to move the country and make it more progressive. So thank you for that. Um, two last things so to, to honor your time. So one, everyone who comes on the show, I give them a tip. So are you on the computer a lot? Do you text and type a lot? Yes. Right, so put your hands together for me, clasp the fingers, and just make wrist circles. This is like wrist therapy. So like the wrist goes in like a full circle and we're like, the only person that should be like this is like Steph Curry. Right, yes. so like take thank those in the other direction. And if your wrists are popping, then it's working. Then it's working. Okay. Right. And then you can stretch the fingers out like this in front of you and then bring it back. So do that a couple of times. Just give the yoga, fingers. man. That's what I'm talking about. Yes. All right. So as so final, final question. Rank your favorite Star Wars movies. I uh, big Star Wars fan, so let's just let it out. Um, rank the movies for us here. I'm going to give you my top three. I can't do all nine. Oh, that's fair. Uh, I, <laughs> Forgot Empire, about that one, right. I mean, Empire Strikes Back. Word. Uh, Star Wars, A New Hope, and Return of the Jedi. Okay. So I'm, I'm sticking with the, the, the original trilogy. Y'all heard it here first, like the original. <laughs> Love that. Um... So I want to thank you for coming, Jamal. I want to thank like Karina, Claire, Luke, and Rebecca, because none of this happens without staff. So shout out to the staff and for staff. everyone who made this happen. 
And, you know, we'll, of course, we'll do all we can to support you. Like, however I can support you personally or however Move On can support you, holler at me. I'm here for this. Like, yes. it was an honor for me to go through my crates and have Stevie and Marvin as, like, strong Black men in support of our conversation. Wilson Pickin didn't make the cut, but him and Al Green are over there. Um, <laughs> they didn't make the cut, though. But lovely to have you. Um, however we can be supportive, like, please let us know. Reach out to me, and we're here for it. Of course, brother. Peace and love, man. Thank you, Reggie. Blessings to you. Thank you. Talk soon. Yes. And as we transition out of this live stream, y'all, um, I just want to thank you for showing up. And remember that we have less than 30 days for the election. So register if you haven't already. Talk to your friends about it. Let's make this, like Jamal said, let's make this an activity. You know, let's get into it as it is a sport because it, it is a sport. And it's the one that matters the most for like for the rest of our for the rest of our lives and for the quality of our lives. So thank you for being here for episode 10. Tune in tomorrow. We'll have Mike Levin from California, I think 49. Um, Congressman Mike Levin from California to talk about his um re-election coming up. So politics and flows, big ideas edition, episode 10, over and out. Elections matter. Justice is on the ballot. Justice is on the ballot when one in five mothers has hungry children. Justice is on the ballot when millions of people just lost their jobs, many of whom did not have paid sick leave, paid family leave, many of whom don't have affordable child care. Justice is on the ballot when we look at the disparities around whose children and where they're living geographically to have access to broadband, to be able to be educated at home, much less have a laptop. Justice is on the ballot when you look at the disproportionate number of African Americans and Latinos who have been afflicted with and have died from COVID-19. Justice is on the ballot when people in our country are struggling like they are right now. So we gotta get everybody out to vote. We gotta take back the Senate. We gotta retain our majority in the House. And we need to win the White House and elect Joe Biden.